Welcome everybody. Welcome to our fifth My HCPC Standards uh, webinar. Really nice to see you. Can't believe it's number five. It still says pre-live on mine. It says pre-live, so I'll probably I'll start again. Uh, yep, go for it. Hello, welcome. Welcome everybody to our My HCPC Standards session number five, where we're going to be looking at respecting confidentiality. Can't believe that we're halfway through our 10 standards and really enjoyed uh, meeting you and discussing them uh, during our time over the last few months. We've got this one and then the next one is actually in January, so a little bit of a break over Christmas. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping to let you know, as usual, they're going to last about 50 minutes. Um, there will be pause a couple of times to answer some questions. Very happy to take questions. Questions. If you could use our chats function on the uh, right hand side of your screen, that would be really helpful. Um, we've got a couple of my colleagues to answer them, which would be really nice. The slides will be available to you after the event and we are recording it. So this event will go up on the HCPC uh, website afterwards. So that's really nice. You needn't take notes or anything. You just enjoy the session. And we are going to use a polling platform called Slido during it. So we will uh, get on if that's all right. So I'm hoping you're going to enjoy today. Um, Whoops, what I, I will notice that I will slightly look to the left occasionally when my, my slides are up on a different screen. So this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the HCPC role and standards, standard five, which is particularly about confidentiality. That's the, the session today. So a little bit about me. My name is Kim Tolley. I'm the professional liaison consultant at the HCPC. I know that you've heard about me talk about hello, my name is before. And I'll ask the a lovely um, Holly, if she wouldn't mind putting the link to looking up Dr. Kate Granger on our chat function. So do have a look at that if you get chance. Um, but my role is to go out and do sessions for um, registrants of the HCPC, uh, and that's really what today is very much about. So a bit about GDPR. I know that we all know quite a lot about it, but just to say that when you do post your uh, questions up in our chat box, your name will be your name will come up there. So do be aware of that. Uh, any comments that you do put up for the future will be um, you will, we may use in marketing, which would be really helpful for us. And we are going to do an evaluation after the event. So Holly, one of my colleagues, will uh, send you a link to a survey to an evaluation after the session. And then once you've done that, you get a certificate, which is really nice to put in your CPD records. So that's a really exciting thing to have. We, we're finding that's quite a popular thing to use. So thank you very much for that. Um, a little bit about Slido. So let's have a look at Slido. Uh, this is the, uh, as you know, the polling system that we've been using quite a lot. You need to enter the event code MyHCPC Standard 5. And I'm going to go onto my, I'm sorry, I'm looking down, but I'm going to go onto my phone where I'm actually controlling the polling. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You're used to these now. So make no apology for the fact that I would really like to know what professional group you're in. If you are, um, they're in the same order on the H as on the HCP website, but if you go down the screen, you will come across the other um, the other registrant titles, the other professional titles. You see that we've got a physio. You're very quick off the mark <laughs> to get that voted. It does sometimes take a couple of votes, um, and sometimes it takes a little while for the note to come. You know, back up to the cloud and back down to the, the PC. So I can see that a few of you are voting, so thank you very much. It does take a while if you've not used Slido before. We are finding it's a really good platform to do voting um, on because it's uh, anonymous and also you don't have to put your name, which I really like. No names, which I think is really important. This information is super useful to us and we have been analysing this over the last five um, webinars because we want to see who we're not reaching. Um, it's great that I can see here we're, we're reaching lots of occupational therapists, lots of physiotherapists, and that's a common theme across the last webinars that we've been doing. But what we are missing is some of the other uh, professional groups. I can see, for example, at the moment there aren't any hearing aid dispensers or operating department practitioners. And it would be nice, we're going to have a, a really tough think about how we can actually engage with those other registrants because it's really important. The HCPC, as you know, uh, represents 15 um, professional groups and it's important that we engage with all of you to make sure that you're happy with the service that you have and this is one of the bits of the service that we we can offer you. So thank you very much. I'm going to just give it a couple more minutes because I can see they're climbing the votes as we speak and it's always nice to to get everybody who's there. So thank you very much for that. It's really super helpful. So another question that we have asked quite a lot um, after during each webinar but it's again helpful to us. We asked you when you think of the HCPC, what word comes to mind? Um, please don't use any swear words. Um, but this is helpful to us because we like we 
we like to know what you think of us as registrants. Uh, it's really important, again, that we, you know, we reflect what you want. And one of the things that um, we want to know is what actually you think of us, because that sort of drives what we do for, for you as registrants. And I can see that quite a few of you are saying standards. That is actually what we do. And that's what today's all about, uh, our standards and being professional. And in, in fact, today in confidentiality is a really central part of professionalism, isn't it really? It's really central to being a healthcare professional. Um, it's probably the central tenant of what trust um, is based on. So thank you. I can see there are some lovely quests, a lovely um, things, CPD. Trust, discipline, public protection. Thank you very much. Lovely. I'm really appreciating that. Thank you very much. So that's brilliant. So let's move on to our next slide, if that's OK. So a little bit about the ACPC role and standards. Again, if you want to look at this in any great depth, I have covered it in, in a little bit more depth in previous webinars. But just to say that our role is to protect the public, obviously, it's to maintain a register of healthcare registrants. Uh, it's to write our standards and guidance. It's to uh, do fitness to practice um, and it's to do CPD as well and those are the range of our standards and guidance um, that we cover our green one as I call it because I had to learn right from the beginning our orange one which is to do with CPD our red ones which we're going to cover um, today and the blue standards of proficiency for each each sort of what's it called each professional group so today we're going to look at the fifth standard of conduct, performance and ethics, confidentiality. And as I said, this is a biggie, really. This is something that underpins everything that you do as healthcare professionals. And actually, it's what trust in the profession is actually based on. OK, so that's really important. But before we go on, I'm going to introduce your, um, if you don't mind, introduce a couple of other HCPC staff who we've got here and my colleagues. So Kelly, would you mind saying hello? Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Green and I'm the Professionalism and Upstream Regulation Lead at the Health and Care Professions Council. Um, I work very closely with Kim and Holly and also uh, Matt, who you're going to meet shortly, working really to deliver some of these events, working with employers um, and producing lots of things for our website and guidance and tools and things as well to help you. So it's very nice to meet you. Well, um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Lovely, thank you very much. And Matt, would you mind saying hello? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Clayton. I'm a senior policy officer at the ACPC, working on the policy and standards team. Um, I, we take a lot of policy inquiries from registrants. I think that where people have questions about how to apply the standards, that's generally where we come in. Thank you, Matt. We'll, we'll hear from you later if that's all right, Matt. And Holly. Hi there, thanks Kim. My name's Holly. Um, I'm the Events and Communications Officer at the HCPC. So I um, help to organise all the events um, within the organisation um, and help with lots of different communications activities as well. And you send all the emails, so thank you very much, Holly, <laughs> sending all the information out to everybody. Yes, I apologise for lots of emails. <laughs> no, it's great. OK, thank you. Thanks, Holly, and thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Matthew. We'll talk to you in a bit. Kelly is kindly going to be monitoring our chat box, but uh, and Matt's going to be contributing to some of our discussion later. So one more, two more questions, actually. So when you think of standard five, this is what we're going to be looking at today, I want you to rate your current knowledge and understanding of this standard. So, for example, do you know how many bits there are of standard five? Do you know specifically what we talk about in relation to confidentiality and how would you rate that now? I can see fantastic. Some people are saying um, quite high, which is good. So I think confidentiality is, is really a central tenant that you're taught. And certainly as a nurse, I was taught a lot about during my my pre-registration training and something that we actually do quite a lot of CPD on because we, we do things like um, data protection and things like that on our e-learning usually every year or every two years. So we do know quite a lot I know about um, standard five, but this is this is great. So thank you. It gives us a real good idea of, of where you sit in standard five and we'll do this at the end if that's all right to see if it's changed because it gives, again gives us a good feeling about how we feel about the session and how it's gone today and it gives us a little bit more data. It's really important that we use your uh, registrants fees wisely and this is one of the ways we're using them so we want to make sure it meets your needs and um, that's the basic really important part so thank you very much for that perfect. So I'll go back to my slides if that's all right. 
So standard five, it's two parts of standard five. <laughs> uh, the first part is about using information and the second part is disclosing information. Now we've had quite a lot of feedback from you on, in your surveys and we've tried to act on them over the last few webinars and we're trying to um, add a few more case studies into these sessions because I think everybody loves a case study, everybody loves the reality of practice and again these case studies come from our inquiry line, come from the inquiry sort of email box that Matt and his colleagues monitor at the HCPC. So they're really, really useful. So let's look at our first case study and see what we think. Um, oops, sorry, missed that. So yes, oh, before we do that, sorry, just to mention that we have fantastic confidentiality guidance for registrants. It's all there for you. It's in a separate booklet, which I think is quite important. And we've already talked about that confidentiality means protecting information. And we've already talked about the importance of confidentiality and that trust between you and your patients. And breaking confidentiality can have a big impact on public confidence related to all healthcare professionals. So it's really important. So let's look at our, our case study, if that's all right. Uh, Ravinda, she's an art therapist. I'm not sure if we had any art therapists on the line. I don't think we did. Um, and I'll let you just have a little read of that. And I'm going to ask Matt to see what he thinks about this sort of query. So just to say, Matt, it's, it, I'm right in saying, aren't I, that actually um, you've had quite a lot of these queries right at the beginning of the pandemic, but actually they've people have got into the remote remote consultations these days, haven't they? And and settled into the sort of whole process of remote consultations, which we're actually going to look at in a minute in relation to confidentiality. Yeah. So you had quite a lot of a lot of these, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um I am unmuted, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. We we definitely did. I think a lot of people made a move to telehealth very quickly, so we had a lot of questions initially. And so when we're dealing with a question like this, I think there's two specific things we would signpost people to. And the first is our general guidance on confidentiality that you mentioned earlier. So that's going to set out a lot of our expectations about confidentiality in general, and I think set out our standards and the rules that we expect people to follow. The second thing is a resource that we developed specifically because of COVID-19. We saw so many people so quickly moving to telehealth was just more of the sort of scenarios people might face, I think, especially dealing with some of the issues that are raised in this. Um, I think the first thing I also want to just make clear is that if you're providing telehealth, it's no different to any of the other services you're providing. You have to continue to meet all of our professional standards and all of your standards of proficiency. So with that in mind, one of the things we want people to be very clear about when they're talking about confidentiality in particular is continuing to keep open and honest communication with their service users. And so we know that uh, telehealth is very good, but it does still have limitations. So if you have limitations about the kind of care you're going to be able to provide, if there's limitations to I think some confidentiality, you want to be able to explain that really clearly to your service users so they are informed and can give their consent to these uh, procedures. And I think just something to touch on, which is going to run through all of these case studies, is that the HCPC has very broad standards. We have 15 different professions we regulate. Our standards are about what we want people to achieve, not especially going to be able to tell people what to do in different scenarios because there's just too many scenarios and too many um, professions. So in this case and in many others, what we would really advise people to do is to get in touch with their professional body as a first call. Your professional body is going to have a lot more experience about dealing with your practice specific questions. They're going to have best practice to give to you. And when it comes to handling issues around confidentiality, we're also going to advise people to contact Information Commissioner's Office. They're going to be your first port of call. We're going to talk about them more in another case study. Brilliant, Matt. Thank you. Yes, and I think that's the really important thing is we've all got into the habit of doing remote consultations. So we thought, uh, Matt and I thought it would be just useful just to remind everybody about a few key issues, particularly related to confidentiality uh, in remote consultations. So with that in mind, um, thinking about before um, your remote consultation, thinking about you know, location set up and backdrop. I'm sure we're all really getting used to this, thinking about the way we're coming across when we're on screen, uh, thinking about privacy in our own homes, just like Ravinda was starting to think about. I think we've probably got all got that nailed now, but also thinking about um, 
things like communication can be begin before the consultation and thinking about finding out about service users special needs, requirements such as hearing, visual uh, needs and also thinking about translation services if they're actually required. Um, so those things are really, really important to think about even before um, your consultation. Then in confidentiality is, is, you know, introducing yourself and anybody who's with you, checking who's with the service user, because again, that's super important because, you know, it's important to not for you to document who's with the service user, because obviously they aren't maintaining, they're maintaining confidentiality with the person with them, but that's important that you have that documented. And also checking that you can be seen, you can be heard and explaining about confidentiality, you know, explaining to your service user where you are, where you're sitting in your house and how you are maintaining confidentiality. I think that's really, really important just to put their mind at rest, really, because I think that's that's something you would do normally, but it's it's more difficult in remote consultation. So just some tips and, and clues, really. During the remote consultation, you know, thinking about privacy, I have a little note on my door that says it's got a bit of blue tack and I say, please don't disturb. Um, because sometimes it is tempting for people to stand outside my, my uh, house door and think, should I pop in with a cup of tea? Um, and thinking about taking notes and how you do that during your consultations. After consultations, the most important thing about confidentiality is to keep records secure. Either password protected on a computer or if you are um, doing handwritten notes to think about where they're locked away. Uh, it's really, really, really important. Um, there are 10 key principles in remote consultation, and these are not just for remote consultation. These are also for prescribing as well. So these were adopted by all regular by lots and lots of different regulators, uh, the GMC, for example, and the ACPC. And these are 10 key principles that everybody can apply during remote consultation. I just think they're really useful to remind yourself of those. So do have a look at them. But I think um, it's particularly about identifying vulnerable patients and difficulties that um, safeguarding issues during consultations can be quite complex, can't they? But actually, aftercare, sharing relevant information, doing a follow up email is also really important. So those are 10 sort of key principles. So I'm going to pause there because we have may have a few questions. Um, Kelly is kindly monitoring our questions and I wondered Kelly if he had anything. Sometimes people are using Slido, sometimes people are using the chat function. Is there anything Kelly that you'd like to, anybody would like to say particularly about confidentiality at the moment? Thanks Kim. Um, actually no, not at oh, the moment. So um, no now is the time really if you've, if you've got <laughs> some questions. Um, please do type them in the chat box and we'll try to answer them as we go along. But at the yeah. moment we've mostly got um, hopefully the links that uh, Holly's been sharing with people. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank that's, you. That's, that's great then, thank you. We'll carry on then, perfect. So, oops, my next slide, sorry my apologies. So thinking about case studies again. This is a very common uh, case study that I know that Matthew and his colleagues have been getting. Um, it's about Kendra, who's a practitioner psychologist, and one of her clients is actually abroad um, in France and is actually uh, living there for the time being. And Kendra's asking if she can continue giving therapy remotely to this patient. So Matt, I'm going to pass you over to you if that's all right and see what you can say about that one. Thanks. So the first thing to keep in mind is that there's nothing that prohibits you as a registrant from practicing telehealth to any service users in the UK or outside of the UK. So there's nothing wrong with providing telehealth services to someone who's based in France, for example. With that in mind, because you've got uh, permission from the ATPC doesn't mean that you are clear to practice in any country. So we're going to advise that everyone who does practice in another country or sorry, provide services in another country, contact your professional body or contact the relevant regulator in that country to make sure that you're following local laws and regulations in the host country that your service user is based in. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, again, it sounds obvious, but just make sure that you continue to meet all of our standards, everything that we've said before about confidentiality, everything about um, speaking clearly and making sure that your service users understand those limitations still, still applies. The, Two other things that are a bit more technical is you might want to speak to your professional body about ensuring that you are following all the laws in the UK around data protection. So this is going to particularly be an issue if you're moving data from a GDPR country or sorry, from the EU. Um, I know that the, we still are using GDPR in the UK, but what the data protection situation is going to look like in a few years isn't entirely clear. And especially if you're moving data from any country to another country, you're just going to want to make sure that you're not violating any data protection laws when you're moving client information between two different jurisdictions. 
And then finally, not related to confidentiality, but I think a thing that doesn't cross a lot of people's mind is that you want to check with your indemnity, insurance indemnity provider to make sure that this kind of coverage, uh, sorry, this kind of practice is covered in your policy to make sure that you're working within your scope of what's covered. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. That's fantastic. Yes, totally agree. I think professional indemnity is really important to check and we're going to cover that later, aren't we, really, because it, it covers so many dish, um, you know, different nuances and it's really important to check it. So thanks, yes, Kendra. So she can, uh, but she needs to bear in mind some of those really important things, which is really helpful. OK, so I wanted to promote, I have talked a little bit about this um, this part of our website before. The HCPC has got some quite useful case studies on fitness to practice, which are on our website. And there's a there's quite an interesting one uh, that I just wanted to flag to you. Um, it's about a registrant, um, a physiotherapist actually, who unfortunately left a notebook containing lots of uh, confidential service user information in a client's home. Um, the difficulty was is that what the registrant didn't do was going soon she realized she or he realized didn't go and collect it straight away so unfortunately it wasn't collected in a timely matter and it had quite a lot of highly sensitive personal data in it um, the registrant came before um, the fitness to practice panel um, and it was felt particularly because um, they didn't go and collect they didn't act in a timely way then actually the the outcome uh, was that public confidence in the profession would be undermined if a finding of impairment wasn't made. So this uh, registrant had a 12 month caution order and you can read more details in the case study. And the reason I flag it was because I think it is important, um, you know, we're all liable to data breaches, to leaving things in different places. But if we do, it's really important we follow our process. Every organisation will have a process of what to do if you leave any uh, sensitive information anywhere and you make sure that you follow that, you talk to your manager, as soon as possible and you try and deal with the issue as soon as you can. I think that's a really, really important thing. So we do have some some quite in, interesting case studies on our website that, that's worth having it worth having a look at. So that brings us on to the second part of our confidentiality. Now, this part's um, quite important that we we understand all this um, and it's about disclosing confidential information. Uh, we can uh, disclose confidential information and there are certain there are four What's the word? Four reasons why we can disclose confidential information. You can disclose information, confidential information if you've got permission from the service user, if the law allows it, if it's in the service user's best interest, and we will look at this in a minute, or it's in the public interest and it's necessary to protect public safety or prevent harm to other people. And we're going to look at each one of these and think about when we might be able to disclose confidential information. And remember I talked about the fact earlier that confidential information is really important that patients and clients uh, perceive this confidential nature of the relationship between a professional and them as really central to the professional uh, relationship and how important it is. So it's no mean feat really. And I just wanted to flag also that identifiable information is not just name, age, sex, date of birth and address. It's actually information about people's health, treatment or care. It could be photos, images um, that you've got stored and it could be in any information that a service user or family member shares. So we've got to take reasonable steps to make sure that our the way we store data is safe and in, is safe and somewhere that nobody can get it basically. So lockable filing cabinets. I love the fact there's a filing cabinet picture there. I know that lots of us, our computers are a filing cabinet these days, but as I said earlier, some people are using paper, so it does have to be locked away uh, if, if you're using somewhere um, and you're using a, a notebook or paper information. So let's look at the four reasons for disclosing information. So as I said, it's with the, with the service user consent, without the service user consent, involving the law, and also if a regulator asks you to. So let's look at the first one with consent. Let's look at some of the reasons. Now, this might be a request, for example, to send information to insurance company, government agency, or indeed a solicitor. So let's think about what we're going to do in that situation. And I'm going to introduce uh, Addy, a newly qualified speech and language therapist. Congratulations, Addy, for getting qualified. Um, and Mr. Adan, Andan, one of his patients with motor neuron disease. So I'll let you have a little read about that. So, Mr. Anand has asked you to send this report to his neurologist and GP about the recommendations for a certain type of thickness. Um, so we just want to think through what are the things you need to do before you send that report. So I'm going to pass you over to Matt now for a second. So Matt, I'll let you think about that. 
Thanks. So Kim has spoken about providing information with consent, and there's two different things to take into account here. We've got expressed consent and implied consent. In this example, we've got a pretty clear case of, imp of implied consent. So expressed consent involves someone positively communicating their agreement, whereas implied consent can be taken as understood even if there's no specific communication in that respect. So for example, uh, the most common example is where a service user has agreed to receive treatment from you. And because of that, and because we understand that most service users understand the importance of sharing information between professionals, there is an assumption that there is, a, that there is consent there. So even though you do have that implied consent, there's a couple of things you should be taking into account here. And the first thing is that whatever information you're sharing, it's only what's necessary for the continued care of that service user. The second thing is that the person you're sending it to, so the other professional you're sending it to, they need to know why you're sending it to them, that you're only sending what's relevant, and that they also still have a duty of confidentiality. And so when you do have implied consent and you're fine to share this information, if you have any doubts about how your service user understands this information is being used or what it's being used for, for example, then you just want to have a chat with them and make sure you get express consent. So as soon as your service user isn't understanding what you're sharing or who you're sharing it with or what the purpose is, for example, that makes the consent that they're giving you a little more tenuous. So just it's worth having a chat with them and getting that express consent and just making sure everyone's on the same page. Brilliant, Matt. Thank you. So yes, I think you're you're quite right. And I think it's also, isn't it, about sharing that letter um, with Mr. Anand and making sure that he's happy with it, so that he's actually got a copy as well, um, as well as keeping it in your notes. Obviously, it's really important. So brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. That's fantastic. So let's go on to the next one. This is a little bit more complex, but it's without consent, um, and this is a little bit more. Com Oops, complicated because it's thinking about, you know, whose best interest is it, is it within, isn't it, Matt? And, and that's a really important one. So this is Johannes. He's a paramedic um, and he was attending a road traffic accident yesterday. I'm going to let you read the rest of that. So what I would say before you start, before Matt starts looking at the answer is, I think I'm very well aware that there's a horrible feeling when you go home from work and you worry about something. And thinking, was this the right thing to do is also always a horrible feeling. Never Try never to leave work uh, worrying about something that you've done. Always try and talk about it with a colleague before you leave, leave work. Because there's nothing worse than going home and worrying and not sleeping and worrying about what happened. So it would be important to talk this through with somebody to make sure that they thought also you did the right thing. And if you didn't, work out what you're going to do. So Matt, um, what are you what are you going to do, Matt, in this? What are you going to advise Johannes in this situation? A little bit more complex, isn't it? Yeah, and I think this is a good example of the, the broad standards the HCPC has. We don't have a specific rule that's going to tell a paramedic what to do in this situation. But what we do expect is because we've got our broad standards is that we expect registrants to use their professional judgment and continue to work in the service user's best interests. So in this example, I think using your professional judgment, you can ask a couple of questions maybe. And I think there's a reasonably good assumption that this person is a relation to the other, uh, to the service user, for example. So again, you're just using your professional judgment there. You can ask a couple of questions. And if you decide to share this information, very similar rules to the rest of the discussions that we've had about confidential information, you're sharing what's necessary, what's relevant at the time. And I think you're doing what you think is in the best interest of the service user. Um, again, maybe something you want to take notes about later when, when you're off shift, for example, when you're making that handover to the staff at the A&E, if that's what's happening, you might want to make that in your handover discussion with them. And it's just about keeping notes and reflecting on, um, or rather providing uh, written sort of reasons for the rationale behind your decision making. I think that helps with a lot of people for, if you do have any concerns, then at least you've got a written record to fall back on. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Matt. And I think for me, it was it was also, like you said, the handover is really important. So you're handing over the information, you're introducing 
the person. I know that paramedics do that when patients come to hospital, they introduce the relative to the nursing and the medical team in the hospital so that everybody knows who's with the patient um, and what relationship um, that the patient is with, you know, is, is part of. So I think that's really, really important. Brilliant. OK, so that seems to have covered that one. And again, just to reinforce, never go home and worry. It, it's a very grim thing to do, having done that myself many times. Um, so wanted to just think about uh, best interests because Matt mentioned best interests and it's reasonable to assume that this lady who's with him and who introduces themselves to uh, you as his wife, it's reasonable to assume that it's his wife and it's in it's in his the patient's best interest for you to share information as as Matt said about the situation that you find yourself in um, and that's covered by the Mental Capacity Act 2005 and the Mental Capacity Act Northern, Al Northern Ireland 2016. Um, it sets out really all the really important things to think about when you're acting on somebody who doesn't have capacity and this patient who's unconscious in the road traffic accident doesn't have capacity. So thinking about all the, you know, all the circumstances relevant to them, thinking about when they might, if they might have capacity in the near future. It depends, doesn't it, really, whether he regains consciousness or if any decisions about his care or um, confidentiality, confidential information that can be shared can be postponed. It might be very difficult to do that um, and to take into account sort of people who are with him, close relatives, friends, carers and guardians. But we will be looking at capacity in a lot more depth in the future, but it's really that balancing act, isn't it? Uh, and thinking about weighing up best interest. Um, I think that's a really important part. OK, so the, the sorry, the third one is by law. And this is really important because obviously uh, if somebody turns up and asks for something and says that they're acting in the in, in the law, it's a lawful uh, ask for some some information, then obviously you're going to feel quite anxious about it. Um, and so we've thought about this scenario that comes up quite a lot in our inbox. Um, so this is Jim. An occupational therapist. We've got a few occupational therapists uh, on the call today uh, and Jim's received a court order disclosure about a patient who he looked after a year ago. So a little while ago um, and obviously that's something that probably only happens a couple of times in your career as a healthcare professional. Some healthcare professionals more than others um, and Jim needs to think about what to do and who can give him who can give him advice and and we often get these these um, requests in um, there are lots of other people that Jim can ask, I know, but I'm going to see what Matt uh, would say to Jim in this situation. There you go, Matt. Yes, so I think this is a very good uh, example of the importance of being able to seek independent legal advice, speaking to your professional association again. Uh, so the HCPC is very happy to advise any of our registrants about how to meet our standards, but this is a bit more of an issue about how to follow the uh, specific pieces of legislation. So it is important to very specialised parts of the law that you might want to speak to a, a solicitor about independent legal advice. And so a good example of why it's good to speak to a solicitor is that if you're providing information, I think it's very natural given everything else we've said that you're going to want to speak to your service user and sort of loop them in. Uh, under some of these pieces of legislation, telling your service user that you provide that information could actually be a crime because these, you have been asked to provide the information about an ongoing crime or an ongoing case, for example. So it's very important to get proper legal advice and make sure that you are following the law. Linked to that, not every um, request for information that looks legal is something that creates a legal obligation for you. So a letter from a solicitor might not be something you have to respond to under law. Again, speak to someone that you're happy getting legal advice from and just make sure you're following the law. From our standard side, we expect you to follow the law, obviously. So if you get a legal requirement to provide this information, we expect you to follow it. The other thing is that we also, like all of our other disclosures, only provide what you've been asked for. Once you start providing things outside of what you've been asked to provide, then you start having your own confidentiality issues again. The final thing just on this point would be about that unfortunately a lot of these uh, court ordered or legal disclosures that you are required to make by law involve minors. So if you do have minor patients, it's an important thing to think about your own safeguarding policies or your employer's safeguarding policies relating to children and make sure you're following those as well because as HPC, we expect all of our registrants to follow their local policies as well as all their legislation. And it's a complicated one, Matt, isn't it? And I think the other complication, what complicated uh, angle to it for me is that I know you also get quite a lot of inquiries uh, after a patient's died. So during the maybe during the investigation, um, the there will be a legal 
ask of a registrant to provide information about a patient who's actually died and the care that they've been they've had um, and that is also complicated as well and I, I know that the same principles apply don't they? Yes so your, your duty to confidentiality doesn't uh, end if your patient passes away they still have a right to that confidential information. Again, if you've been legally asked to disclose it, you can disclose it, but you are still thinking about all the same limitations that we've discussed if your patient, even if your patient has passed away. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So it's those, what Matt and I would say is that uh, a lot of the confidentiality queries that come into the inbox are incredibly detailed and incredibly complex. Um, and I know that Matt and his team work very hard to talk to you about the principles that can be applied from our standards, but also maybe direct you to other areas if you're not sure where to go. Um, and the other thing to say is we really, really are very happy to take those uh, and to, to help you as much as we can, but also remember to check your professional indemnity. Uh, getting making sure that you're covered with for legal advice is really important with your indemnity because you could be in a situation and legal advice can be very expensive. So it's worth it's worth just checking uh, whether that's actually covered in your indemnity insurance. I think that's really important. OK, so we've been through lots of case studies, which have been fantastic. And my last one before I go over to Kelly with any questions is to think about the regulators. Uh, there may be a may be a situation um, where you might have to disclose confidential information to a regulator. For example, the most common one really is the Care Quality Commission. Um, they could ask for information about service users and it's important to think about redacting that information um, and making sure that there is uh, no identifiable information in the, any reports that you send. But also, again, taking legal advice and seeking help from your managers in that situation would be really, really important. So that could be another example, another example where you could um, disclose information but it would have to be redacted um, and you'd also have prob you'd also they recommend that you would also tell the service user if you've also done that as well so if you're, you're going to have to do that as well so those are the sort of main reasons why you can disclose information about confidentiality and I really want to flag up again our confidentiality guidance because it's so it's so good really and I'm I'm thinking that for some people you might be thinking gosh I, I need to read up more about confidentiality so I certainly use this as your first point of call but also think about some some training, particularly on confidentiality. And I've had a look around the local colleges um, for some of the professional groups, and they've got some really good um, training for CPD on confidentiality that you might actually like to look at. Um, and again, remember that Matt and his team are always happy to answer any questions that you've actually got about confidentiality. So coming to you, Kelly, any questions before we move on? Thanks, Kim. Um, yes, yeah, so we've had a couple in and I think one um, that, I'll, that I'll draw on has actually come in on the Slido app and that's um, a question about whether if you took a photo of a patient that does identify the patient at a road traffic collision and could you post them on social media or would you get into trouble posting them on social media? So I think there's, there's quite a lot of issues um, mm -hmm. around that focusing in on the confidentiality aspect and just rem you know remembering the the steps that um Matt and Kim have just taken us to in terms of different times that you might be able to disclose patient information I think probably how I would respond to this is to say that you know, images of a patient are part of their records mm. um, they should really only be taken with their consent and shared with their consent and the sharing of them really should be on a professional basis and um, you know for learning perhaps or sharing of information with other relevant professionals that, that will enhance the care of that patient and um, should be done with consent ordinarily aside from the reasons that, that that we've just explored about when you can do it without the patient's consent so the consent would need to cover the purpose of the disclosure really um, so the posting of it and that they are content for that to be done. But I think the starting point really is also consent to take the images in the first place. Yeah, very so. much so. Very much so, Kelly. And we've got, if you look back at our last uh, webinar, I think we did mm. look at social media, yeah. we did look at images um, and the sort of, the, and also the importance of not posting anything on social media that identifies, has any identifiable data or any indeed any identifiable data that can be joined together to make you realise who a person is. Because some, sometimes, yeah. if you, even if you've got the patient's name, you can work out who the person is. That's really important. Well, that's it. I think you know, if if, if you know the patient, um, then there's a good chance if if their identity is shown that you can you can recognise who they are, and then you are being yeah. shared confidential information about that patient. 
yeah totally agree with you thank you um, anything else nothing else fantastic brilliant yeah that's thank great. you that's great fantastic thank you very much kelly remember you don't have to ask all our questions now so you know plenty of opportunity to write into us and every month we have these webinars we can save them up for us as well um, I just wanted to um, talk a couple of a couple of resources for you today, if you don't mind. The first one is our student hub. Uh, this was launched yesterday, I think it was Kelly, wasn't it? Yesterday, um, and it's been very very important uh, effort within the HCPC to design a set of pages really that talk about students and their needs. So if any of you are lecturers on the call uh, or know any students, this is a great place to come for them to, for all their standards and guidance. And it's split up a bit like our webinars. It's split up under the 10 standards and guidance and you can see information about what the HCP is and learning materials. So I think there's a wealth of information and we're really very proud of uh, proud of that. So that's a really new, exciting development at the HCPC. So hope you enjoy. Hope you enjoy looking at that. Um, as we move into the next part of uh, the pandemic, um, there's some really good stuff on our website. There's also some quite good stuff that's just about to come out on the role of vaccinations and the role of professionals giving vaccinations. So that's quite useful as well. So there's all that information on, on the web there and our usual standards pages on our HCPC website. And as we've already said, you can access all these webinars on our pages as well, which is quite useful. So save the date. I can't believe it's 2021 nearly, um, but the 20th of January is our next webinar at 1 p.m. And we're going to be looking at managing risk and managing risk with, for you as healthcare professionals standard six. So I'm hoping that you'll enjoy that. So we, we've covered today as we've looked at confidentiality, using information and disclosing information. And before I forget, I'm going to thank Matthew, Kelly and Holly for their contributions today, which is obviously fantastic. And I'm going to move on to a little bit of our evaluation again um, and just ask you some very, very quick questions. The first one being, after this session, how now would you rate your, stand, your understanding of standard five of the standards of conduct, performance and ethics? Really, really useful for us again. And we will overlay these, believe it or not, we overlay these charts to the one that you said at the beginning to see whether you've increased your knowledge and understanding, which I hope that you have a little bit. I know for lots of you, we were very well aware that this is a very quick revision of confidentiality. It underpins so much of what we do. So we felt that it was a very, very quick uh, revision and a quick revision session. So we weren't feeling too uncomfortable about covering some of the basics for you. OK, and the next one, sorry, I clicked off that one. And the next one, um, again, really useful for us. Now you think of the HCPC, what word comes to mind? You've put some good words up there last time. Regulator, standards, CPD. I wondered if they changed, if they're different. Just pop some words up. It's really useful for us. Um, we find it very, very helpful. And you're right, we are a patient safety organisation. And thank you for saying we're supportive. We hope that we are. We are trying to respond to your needs and trying to do these sessions based on what we, what we and what you say is useful to you. We read your evaluations every single um, month that you send them in and we try and act on them as much as we can because we think it's really really important to act on those and make sure that we're meeting your needs as we said. I'm going to leave that for a few more seconds to see whether anybody's got anything else to say um, but I can assure you we do use this information. It's not just information you're giving us and we're not going to do anything with. We do actually use it. <laughs> I love it when the words get bigger. It always makes me feel slightly I don't know how it does it. It's always very satisfying. It's very, very satisfying. So thank you very much for that. OK, and last couple of things. Um, how likely are you to recommend this training to your colleague on a scale of one to ten? Useful again um, to make sure that you're happy with this and that it's providing meeting your needs. Um, and as um, we didn't say earlier, but our professional liaison service is always very happy to come and uh, deliver sessions to colleagues, to groups of colleagues about our standards and guidance. So do contact us. I'm going to leave the emails up at the end. If you need anything from us, we're very happy to help. Uh, and two more lovely questions. Has this session helped you reflect on your practice? Yes or no? Really quick, quick, quick answer for you. Quick buzz. Yes or no? It's really helpful. It doesn't take two seconds. And then we're on the home stretch there before our Christmas break, which is even better, isn't it? OK, and my last question whoops, is, has your knowledge, whoops, has your knowledge of the role of the HCPC improved? Yes, no, or it was already good. And while that's running itself, um, I wanted to wish everybody a, a good break. If everybody is able to have a break this Christmas, I'm hoping that 
we will have a few days, whatever, and have a break over the holiday period. Uh, but thank you, that's that's really helpful. OK, so that's super helpful. Thank you. Go back to my presentation. So this is our, oops, sorry, this is our contacts. We've got Facebook account, which is really useful, our Twitter, our LinkedIn, and our professional liaison service email policy email. That's you go direct to Matt and his colleagues. Um, registration department with any registration queries and fitness to practice with any fitness to practice queries. So wanted to end on a big thank you as usual for all the work that you're doing, particularly at this difficult time and particularly over the holiday period as well. Some of you won't be able to have holiday, I know, but if you can, as I said, grab a few days, that's really important. And a big thank you also to Holly, Matt and Kelly for their contributions today. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, we will continue to do these in January and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Um, please take care, everybody. I'm going to finish the um, webinar now. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>